Thank Hello, you. everyone. Let's give the date here, uh, Martin Luther King Day. Uh, many of you were home from work. Uh, some were not. Uh, January 15th. Okay, I was not uh, home from work. I would, uh, those of us in Canada were not home. <laughs> okay, well, uh, a few things. Um, one of you, uh, I forget who, um, emailed me, uh, I don't know if it was Nissan, I forget, that uh, Emmanuel Jakobowicz's Shame Kodesh was Yisrael. That is true. Uh, and although by the time you get to the 20th century, uh, many people in Germany uh, had secular names. That is, Goyesha type names. Uh, um, Emmanuel Jakobowicz, I've said it before, I'll say it again, he is named after Emmanuel Kant. So it just shows you how uh, assimilated even the Orthodox were. Uh, Pinchas Bieberfeld. Bieberfeld's an important German Orthodox family. Uh, Pinchas Bieberfeld's father, um, Eduard Bieberfeld, rabbi, he was a doctor, he was a rabbi. And in his 30s, I believe late 30s, decided to become a doctor. I mean, real Torim Derech Eretz. He wrote a book, his Hebrew name is Chaim, uh, wrote a book on, um, on Hilcha Shabbos, which uh, used to be widely used. His son, he named his son, his son's Hebrew name is Pinchas, but the name his son went with everyone was Paul, Paul Bieberfeld. Paul was named after Hindenburg. After a victory in World War I, the son was born and they named him Paul after uh, Paul von Hindenburg. So uh, very strange with the German Orthodox. Uh, okay, one of you... Um, I asked a very good question. I didn't think we'd be talking any more about um, Aninus or anything like that. But if you rec so I'll throw in one more thing. If you recall, I said, I raised a question. It's in, in Greenwald's book. You get a telegram and, um, you know, the funeral's tomorrow. So are you an Onin? Are you not an Onin? Machokas the Nitziv and his son-in-law, Rivafal, uh, Shapiro and the Marsha. So the question is, it's a very good question. Uh, well, um, do, do you even have to tell someone? I mean, today, obviously, today we're on the phone. Today, if uh, well, during COVID, we went back to the way it used to be. Because now, of course, if I my grandson has a bris in California, I'm on the plane and I'm going there. I'm on the plane to go to the funeral. But it used to be that no one did things like that. And it wasn't that long ago people didn't do things like that either. Uh, um, but, uh, I mean, it used to be uh, you would get a... a a, a letter uh, months later that someone died or there was a bris and that's the whole so you know vegas called shmur rahoka what's uh, what type of vegas maybe you do one day depends on when you get it uh, but the question is do you need to tell anyone anything do you need to inform someone if someone died today it's unheard of because we're in constant communication but um what about what's the aha though uh, so let me show you something uh here which i think will surprise uh people uh you might even think it's unfair. It's it's not right. It's that. But what can I tell you? So here's the Shulchan uh, Aruch 402, Tough Bays, number uh, Yud Bays. Uh, one, well, in Hebrew, it says, Misha um, Mesla Mes, if someone dies, the low, no, the low, and you don't know about it. There's no obligation to tell someone this. Not only is there no obligation, the practice was. In many places, you don't tell someone. So in other words, if someone died in one city and then uh, in another country or faraway place, the, 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 the people who would have to say shiva were, you wouldn't send a letter there. You wouldn't inform them. And what does the Shulchan Aruch say? You don't even uh, tell that about uh, if it's their parents. Uh, and the Shulchan Aruch goes on and says oh, that you can invite them to a wedding. You know about it, but they don't know about it. So you can invite them to a wedding. All these things that they couldn't do if they're in Avel. Now, what does the Ramos say? Umikoma kom b'vanim zacharim nagu hodia kadeshi yomer kadish aval b'vanos ein min haklal hodia. So the Rama, citing Mari Vile, uh, tells us that uh, the minog, not halach, the minog is. You tell sons, because the sons have to say Kaddish. The Shulchan Aruch doesn't say that. Shulchan Aruch apparently isn't so... Kaddish Yasom, you know, really begins in the Ashkenazic world. So you see that the Shulchan Aruch doesn't th think it's such a big deal. And the Ramah says, only the sons you tell. That's the Minhag. Not, and, but daughters you don't tell. So... Um, 
And you never would tell a parent if the child died. I mean, today, how do you, I mean, you're, we're in telephone communication, but if you know the uh, the son goes to America and the mother is back in uh, Russia, the son dies, you don't say it to maybe you can send some fake letters, whatever you do. We know that was the minog, uh, uh, that people would not inform it. It's obviously, it's impractical today, unless you're dealing with a very, very old person who sort of is in, in and out. And uh, if you don't tell them about, the child died, they won't realize it. But uh, this is a sort of uh, practice that today no one would ever do. So it's a very good question, but I don't think it's relevant today because today I think uh, it's unheard of not to do this. And since we're in constant communication with people, uh, and you, you couldn't get it, you couldn't hide it. The whole idea was that you can get away with it. You can't get away with it today. But I, I want to tell you something funny about this, or not funny. Ruby Charles Salanter had a son, one son. No, two sons. He had two sons. Uh, but he had a son, a brilliant son, named uh, Yitzchak. Yitzchak Lipkin. He um, was a complete Shomer Shabbos, but he also became more uh, enlightened, let's say. He went to the university, even had an invention. And uh, he was uh, treated with great respect, even by the non-Jewish. He died, unfortunately, early at age 30 uh, from, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's some sort of... The English, English translation is, is chicken pox, but I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know if exactly that's what it was. So um, he, incidentally, the Rabbi Sol Salanter spoke about that it's important to learn Russian and to become uh, well, well versed in the world. So when his son did that exact thing, um, the Maskilim seized on it and he made a big deal about it. And he even published when once he came to visit his father in Kenningsburg and the, the Maskilim put out a whole thing saying that uh, the, the great Isaac Lipkins here, who makes his father so proud because he's learned in uh, secular matters and resource launcher published an open letter saying he's not proud of his son. And if anyone has influence on him, you should influence him to return to the way of Torah. So when Rishon Salanter spoke about broadening oneself, he, he didn't mean uh, his own child. He wanted him to, uh, and in general, he, he did, for Russian Jews, what he meant was to know some Russian. He, he, he didn't mean Torah and Derech Eretz, like in Germany, which he supported for German Jews. Okay, so why do I mention this? Because Rishon Salanter's son, he died. And, and he was living in St. Petersburg. And... Um, um, Rabbi Shor Salanter had uh, his student was the Rav there. It's a Blazer, and he told him that he has to watch out for my son. And it's because of it's like Blazer and others that uh, the son remained religious his whole life. And uh, but uh, Rabbi Shor Salanter wrote to uh, you can see in, in the book Tnua Samusar, Volume One, page two twenty nine, that. Uh, um, he writes to Rav Yitzhak Blazer, and uh, he asks him, uh, you know, what's doing with my son? And Rav Yitzhak Blazer replies, it's three months now that he hasn't eaten paspalter, that is non-Jewish bread. Um, so what, what does that mean? There was The only bread in St. Petersburg was non-Jewish bread. Uh, that is from non-Jewish bakeries. They didn't have a kosher bakery. You can eat. You're allowed to eat non-kosher. Non you're not non-kosher. You're allowed to eat bread from a, a non-Jewish bakery as long as it's kosher. The uh, pasakum, uh, we assume, um, I mean, there's a humra during uh, the Yom, the, the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. But in general, that's halacha. You can eat uh, from, there's no bishalakum or anything like that. Um, um, but so there only was uh, regular bread there. So that was Yitzhak Blazer. He couldn't lie to his Rebbe, but he didn't want to tell him he passed away. So he said to him, he he hasn't eaten Paspalter for the last three months. And it's like Salanter got the uh, the point. That's the story that's recorded, that he no longer was living. Uh, in those days, you had the Pale of Settlement. So uh, only special Jews could live in St. Petersburg. Or you, even to visit, you had to have a, uh, a special uh, permission from the government, like, Step grandfather was a chazan with his father, and uh, they got permission to come Russian Yom Kippur go to Moscow to uh, be a chazan. Uh, but uh, the, the typical Jew couldn't. Um, two more things. I'm going to get to Yadid Nefesh too, <laughs> but not not this class. Uh, I've been waiting a few weeks already. Uh, if you recall, I read the Maram Shik's Chuva to. Uh, Rav Bamberger, and he says, he doesn't know, how can you do the reformers? The reformers Machai Chabas, which means they're like, Ov de Zara. So I just want to call your attention to something that I just uh, picked up, and 
Um, here's the book. Um, it's, oh, I got to share. Let me stop sharing the screen here. Um, here's the book, Warmth and Radiance of Gedol Yisrael. I like books like this. Uh, Personal Accounts, Encounters, and Experiences by Rabbi Avishai David. He was in Toronto, I gather, from the books. So I had some stories there. But on page 80, it's actually a chapter on Rav Yerucham Gorelik. Uh, I never knew Rav Yerucham Gorelik, but everyone describes him the same way, as like in this explosive personality, together with great chesed. You know, it's, it's a strange combination. But um, he writes that um, on page 80, he says that, see, what happens is the, show, the Mishnah Brura says as follows. Let me show you something. Um, I don't know. The Tzolchan Aruch says in Hilchas uh, Nesias Kapayim in uh, 128, Mumar an apostate who converted to idol worship may not perform the blessing. Um, okay, so an apostate uh, can't, uh, um, someone who worships idols can't do Nesias Kapayim. So what does the Mishnah Brewer say on this? He says, Mumar, Ben Vodazara, Ben Beshoge, Ben Mezid, either intentionally or unintentionally, even if he did Shuvah. And then he goes on, even if he uh, uh, converted to Das Ha'ishma'elin, that is, even if he converted to Islam, She'enon Ovdi Mavodazara, Muslims, those who listen to our, uh, on December 25th, the Torah in Motion, a wonderful, wonderful day. If you haven't heard it, uh, really great. So I spoke briefer than I usually do. I couldn't elaborate, as is my want. But uh, we spoke about how Islam is not a Vodazara. So, but uh, the Ramos quotes the Achronim that, uh, if you convert to Islam, and then, of course, you come back to Judaism, uh, uh, well, uh, no, it doesn't mean you didn't, no, you didn't come back. I mean, if you already, you converted and you still want to do it, I'm sorry, um, you're you're still a Mumar, even though there's no Avodah Zara. And then look at the Mishnah Baruch says, V'cheinim hu Mumar l'chal Shabbos b'v'hesya ha'reihu ka'ovdei golili v'lois ha'kapah. The Mishnah Baruch says, halacha l'maysa, he doesn't know about the Binyan Sion or anything like that, that if you're a Mechal Shabbos, you can't, he's like an idol worshiper, you can't do um, the Siyas Kapayim, you can't do it. So he quotes here in the Hedi that uh, the Rav Soloveitchik said that his father, Rav Moshe Soloveitchik, did not agree with the Mishnah Bura, uh, who said that a Mumar Achal Shabbos is akin to one who worships idolatry. Rav Moshe Soloveitchik drew a sharp distinction between an idolater and a Mechal Shabbos Befar Hesia. Look, we we don't follow the Mishnah Bura anyway. Um, I, I don't know if anyone does, even in the Haredi world, because we've generally accepted the Binyan Sion, the great German post say, Yaakov Etlinger, that today's Mechal Shabbos are not, they're not really rejecting, they don't know any better, or it's a, it's a Havon. You know, the Chazonish basically holds the same thing. But I thought that's interesting. Okay, the last thing I want to do briefly here is the name. We, 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 um, we spoke, we got into the names, and one of you said, and uh, that uh, we said about the name Yisachar, 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 that it's the only, maybe I misunderstood, it seemed to be, you said, that it's the only time two sins are together. And uh, as was pointed out by uh, Ezra, it's not true. Uh, I mean, you have in um, in Tehillim, this Pasuk, uh, Kuf Samach, what is this? Uh, it's a very long chapter of Tehillim. Hold on. Uh, uh, 119, Kuf Samach, uh, it says, Rejoice at thy word. And I looked up today in the uh, concordance, and there's many examples of word of Sasson and uh, uh, some other things. So, uh, Vesasti. So, please clarify who's, whoever said that. Uh, but in, in the meantime, I want to pull your attention to a couple of things. How should it be re recited? Um, because a couple of people asked me about now Nissan said about the Mincha Shai and uh, what you were told by Rav Tuvia Goldstein. Rav Tuvia Goldstein was reflecting an old practice. The Jordan Penkauer, it's like Penkauer has an article in which he, this, the same article of his, which he discusses how to pronounce Zecher, Zecher, Zecher. He also discusses Yisachar, Yisachar. A few hundred years ago, the practice began, different practices, how to pronounce it, when to recite it. That is, that sometimes you say Yisachar, other times you say Yisachar. But uh, Nissan, you said the Mincha Shai. The Mincha Shai doesn't say that. The Mincha Shai says everywhere you read it as Yisachar. I'm looking at the Mincha Shai right now. And the truth is that everyone, the Masora is, you have to pronounce Yisachar. This other practice where sometimes you say Yisachar, others not, 
that's a few hundred years ago. None of the Rishonim, in fact, the Mincha Shai says explicitly that um, it's all, he, he cites the, the Ramar, Mevalafia, Ibn Ezra, the Radaka. Uh, now, what about Ben Asher and Ben Naftali? Some of you might know that this is a matter of dispute between Ben Asher and Ben Naftali, but it actually isn't. Uh, um, ben Asher says you pronounce it Yisachar, and the second sin is not mentioned. Why it didn't fall apart away, I don't know, because it's a negation of the first sin, but you don't. What did Ben Naftali say? There's actually two versions of Ben Naftali. One says, and I'm looking at it right now from the Chilofim, one says you pronounce it uh, Yis. Sachar, that is Yud Sin, and then you say Sachar, Yis Sachar. Now, this is not in accordance with um, David Kimchi's rules. David Kimchi's rules are whenever you have uh, two letters that are the same, uh, you can't have a Shavanach. So we would say, you don't, we don't say Hin Ni, we say Hin Ni. But um, normally, of course, at the end of a syllable, it's a, sh a silent shva, and in the beginning of the next syllable is a vocal shva. So yish meru. However, the rule of the kimchis is it's um, when it's the same vowel, same letter, then it, you uh, the first one becomes shva na. So it's in and in. But that was not uh, that was not shared by the people before the kimchis. It seems to be a novelty of the kimchis. And one approach is that it's yis. That's a shva under the sin sachar. So Yis Sachar, and the other version of Ben Naftali is that the first letter is a Shin. So it's actually pronounced Yish Sachar. And Penkauer thinks that's the correct version because it would be like Yesh Sachar. That's what it's from. So we have two versions of Ben Naftali, but there's no version that says, uh, uh, I shouldn't say that. There's no version of Ben Naftali that says uh, Yis Sachar. What you, we do have, we have something called uh, Likute Kadmonios, which is recording it, uh, but that's not, um, he. sorry, he records Ben Naftali is saying that. Take that back. But that's not in the Chilu theme, and it's not in the Chuva of Haigalim. But um, but really, uh, according to the Masora, it, it should always give you Sahar. And that's all I want to say about that, and uh, uh, I'll get to Yedid Nefesh next time. What I want to do about Yedid Nefesh, I'll mention it now, anticipate, because some of you might want to send me things, how is it that Yedid Nefesh, uh, one of you said, is it true? Because we spoke about Yedid Nefesh weeks ago when I was wondering where this practice came from, that we say it out loud. And I think we determined, I think Nikki said, it comes from Kibbutz Havi. But someone asks, uh, do we have another case where we, we sing something and we're singing the wrong version and we all know it's the wrong version because we have the actual handwritten text of the Mahaber? And a good thing you don't use the Koran Siddur because at least the Koran Siddur I have only has the version you're not supposed to say because it doesn't fit with those tunes we do. Uh, but I want to show you some interesting things about Yadi Nefesh you probably don't know. Uh, uh, okay, my friends. We are now picking up. I think I have two more classes or class and a half still dealing with the separatism dispute. And then uh, before we return back to Rabbi Bomberger, um, and uh, we finished with um, Germany, we finished with Hungary, and I want to move us into America a bit. And this is going to, it'll be repetition for some of you who've been with me, but there'll be some new things, and I can't not do it. Uh, I can't say we'll go back to the classes of the Rove a few weeks ago, so we'll, we'll do it, although quickly. I do want to, though, one more thing about um, Hungary in the great book I love, I mentioned before, by um, Rabbi Pinchas Miller called Olam Shal Abba which is it's his father's recollections of Hungary, he says that um, on page uh, 461, he says that uh, although the Haredi knew that you cannot go into a reform synagogue and use their shrita, but on other matters, such as Sedaka, Gemilus Chasadim, Chevra uh, Kedisha, the cemetery, he said that the Orthodox and the reform did cooperate. So that's, that's not as extreme as uh, uh, the Hersheyan uh, uh, community. Um, he says something interesting as well. He says that you can't say that the issue is to cooperate with non-Orthodox. That is non-Orthodox as individuals. Um, um, and I, I think Hirsch uh, agrees with this. The issue is the community's reform, but he gives a good proof. Remember they had the dispute in Hungary, the the the, the, the Taiwan, 
the the Orthodox and the Reform, they're all called together by the government, and the Orth and the Reform refused to accept being bound by the Shulchan Aruch by Alacha, and therefore the Orthodox had to split. If the Reform communities would have agreed, that is, the Reform leaders would have agreed that, it, as far as the communities are concerned, publicly will follow the Shulchan Aruch, then there never would have been a split in Hungary. So that shows you there's no issue with the, the non-Orthodox, it's only in an institutional way. But Hirsch would say the same thing. If the non-observant in Germany would have agreed that all the public institutions and all the synagogues would be Orthodox, then non-Orthodox can also remain a member of Hirsch's show. That's okay. They couldn't be a member of the board, but they could be in it. And um, and you had, uh, in Hungary, you had uh, members of Orthodox synagogues who were not uh, Shomer Shabbos, uh, uh, remember, the issue was um, who's going to run the community. And then State of Israel, it's the same thing. You have plenty of non-religious, but the community structure remains uh, a Torah structure. And that's the case. That's why in um, Poland and Lithuania it was so different. Because even though you had Muskelium and you had Bundes and you had communists and you had atheists and all that, and they also were running communities, they never tried to create reform institutions or heretical institutions. They were happy to remain, to allow the rabbi to be an Orthodox rabbi. Sometimes they wanted a Zionist, but the rabbi was always an Orthodox rabbi. And there's always kashras. That's different, of course, than what was going on in Hungary and in Germany, where the non-Orthodox wanted to change the institutions. So Many people have said that that's why you can't, there's a difference between what's going on in Lithuania and Poland. Because yes, you had one board of a community and you had heretics sitting with the rabbis and all that. But the difference is this isn't like Germany because the heretics in Warsaw, they were not interested in getting a reform rabbi and they were not interested in creating a reform baked in and having non-kosher in the, the old age home. In other words, they didn't care about these matters to begin with because they were like secular. Uh, they were not attached to religion. So that is an important difference between, and that is why things were so different in Lithuania and Poland, and maybe why you can't extrapolate. We'll return to this, because um, th this issue is important. Uh, the, the the people in opposition to uh, Hirsch like to point to Germany and like to point to Poland and Lithuania. Okay, but well, let, let's go further, because look, uh, Alstrip begins in Germany and Hungary and but after World War II, it reaches America. Now, we're not speaking, like I said last class, about technical Austria. There's no technical Austria. We don't have Kahilas. They wanted to establish Kahila. This was a big plan early, but even then in America, in the early 20th century, it would have been like a voluntary Kahila that we all donate to. I mean, it's uh, if you listen to Rabbi Jeremy Weeder, he has this, him and Rabbi Kelman have solutions to the tuition crisis. But uh, Rabbi Kelman's makes more sense, I think, uh, because Rabbi Weider's solution assumes that everyone's going to we'll have one community and we'll all send to the same school. But that's impossible because no one's going to send to the same school. Different people want different schools. Uh, the Haredi are not going to send to the same school that the modern are going to. It's just a different uh, side. I, I don't see how it's workable. But uh, so, but we, so at the most, you could have a voluntary kahila where we all agree uh, to, let's say, contribute, uh, and then we'd all support the school. But um, there's no such thing as uh, the government forcing us to be in a kahila, so you don't have technical austerit. But you do have an austerit philosophy that to the that to separate from the non-Orthodox as much as you can. Now, austerit. I don't want to talk about Israel. Um, uh, because I've already spoken about it. I will speak next class, or maybe today, but probably next class about Rav Cook, because Rav Cook, he, he's worth just devoting some time to, because he sees Rabbi Bomberger falsely, but he sees Rabbi Bomberger as uh, like his model. So we'll return to, before we then segue back into Rav Bomberger's life, it's worth seeing what Rav Cook does with Rav Bomberger. But um, I'll just say that in Israel, you could have we could have many classes just on this. Uh, it, it never made sense. Uh, it would be counterproductive because all the monies come from the governments. So how are you gonna? How you, how can you not be part of um, of uh, the, uh, the the larger community? But the Agudis Yisrael, the original approach of Agudis Yisrael was a complete separatism, not to be part of the Vat Halomi. And then after the state was declared, they would say. Uh, not to be member, not to be part of the state, but the Aguda rejects this. By the 1940s, they see that this is not going to get them anywhere. And the Jews coming from Poland and Lithuania, 
even the Jews from Germany, uh, they no longer saw this as something valuable. And the Jews coming from uh, Poland, Lithuania, they always joined the, the general uh, community. It was called the Vatalumi. But the, the, the ironic thing is that the uh, the German Agudistan, when they went to Eretz Yisrael, they identify with the Eid HaKaridi. Yaakov Katz talks about how he was married in Israel by Rabbi uh, Zonenf- Rabbi Dushinsky, Rabbi Zonenfeld, Rabbi Dushinsky, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, there, there was no connection between them. The Torah and Derech Eretz Jews, what's their connection to these uh, extremists in Israel? And of course, it, uh, it fell apart. But that's a, a different topic in and of itself. The only thing I would note here is that someone's going to have to write a history of Agudas Yisrael one day, an honest history, because Agudas Yisrael was formally attacked to the Eid HaKaridit for all those years in the 30s and into the early 40s and in, um, and therefore Agudas Yisrael has to take some of the responsibility. Now, what I'm going to say now has nothing to do with Agudas Yisrael in, in Poland, in Lithuania, in Germany who are dignified people who respected Rav Kook and, and others but the Agudas Yisrael in um, which was the Eid HaKaridit, the Turei Karta the Turei Karta was Aguda. They were all in the same thing they engage in not just character assassination, but the worst kind of abuse and libel and disgusting behavior imaginable in the land of Israel. So much so that in the 50s, when Tzidu Hukuk was invited to become part of the Goodies Israel, he said, how could I join an organization that, um, he said, that uh, brought, brought my father to an early death? Now, uh, the Goodies Israel needs to take responsibility for this because they never... They, they privately protested, but they never threw them out because they, they needed them. And the Gedolim, who were in the Eda Haridit, were either afraid of these people or whatever. I, I don't know. It, it needs investigation. But the most, Agudas Yisrael's umbrella was over the most disgusting anti Torah behavior. And uh, the Gedolim in Europe themselves were, were fed up with this. When the Ger Rebbe, who was a leader of the Agudistan, came to Eretz Yisrael, the local Agudistan treated him with uh, with the worst things imaginable, uh, the way they treated him. And uh, um, so basically, you know, functionally, they were two separate Agudas Yisrael's, but they were connected. And uh, that that's an issue that if they ever let you into the Aguda archives, you could see what Rosenheim was trying to do, what Breuer was trying to do, and what the Ger Rebbe were trying to do, but they sort of, they couldn't control the fanatics, the madmen in, um, in Israel. And the, the crazies that you see today in Israel they are direct descendants of uh, these people. Um, okay, I want to, though, speak about um, the ideology of Austritz in America. Now, before World War II in America, you had two types of rabbis, Orthodox rabbis. You had uh, old-fashioned rabbis, the ones who came from Europe, who spoke Yiddish, who were strong in those days because uh, you still had a large Yiddish-speaking population. And then you had the more modern rabbis educated by Yeshivas Rebitz Hanan. And uh, this was a battle between the two rabbis and communities could choose and communities that were run by older old timers with like these old rabbis. And by the way, there were big Tamil Chachamim in all these little places. Um, I mean, up in, uh, in in Portland, Maine, and in Omaha, Nebraska, and all uh, little towns everywhere you go, you had big rabbis who wrote Sfarim and, and Tamil Chachamim. Uh, uh, the, um, the old-fashioned rabbis as the young generation uh, rises, um, they were being pushed out in favor of the more the younger rabbis, and they never really integrated on the scene, um, American scene, they didn't speak English, they didn't have really any sort of organized cooperation with the non-Orthodox, they were hired, they had a little show, they did some uh, hashkacha, they did weddings, and that was that. Um, if a politician was coming to town, all the rabbis would get together to greet the politician, the reform rabbi, the uh, the Orthodox rabbi, I um, I was Zoha to learn one summer with Rabbi Soloveitchik. The last summer he had the summer kobo. And I was also Zoha that uh, I was with uh, Rabbi Chaim Jachter. Chaim Jachter had a car, although I think maybe one day I had the car because uh, I also had a car. And uh, we drove Rabbi Soloveitchik back and forth. So here you had from the Torsky. So here you had like 10 minutes to speak to him. So I asked him all sorts of questions. Uh, and one of the things I told him was, I um, I don't know how we got into the conversation, but I said to him that this I was there the summer of 85. So this what I'm going to tell you about happened in the summer of 84. I say 
I don't remember how we got into the conversation, but I told him, I said, do you, I asked him, do you know Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld? I mean, it's a stupid question. Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld, as I know now, but I was 18 years old then, or 19, 18. I was going to be 19 in August. Uh, Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld was one of the closest students of Rabbi Soloveitchik, colleague students of Rabbi Soloveitchik. So the idea, but I didn't know that. This is the, the brother-in-law of Rabbi Emanuel Jakobovitz. So I said to him that... Um, Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld uh, gave the uh, the address at the Republican National Convention, uh, the prayer. Uh, when uh, Mayor Soloveitchik did it in 2012, a lot of people were saying it's the first time the rabbi ever did it. It's it's, it's not true. I remember Fabian Schoenfeld, and I found you can hear it on, you can hear it on YouTube, his, uh, his uh, uh, prayer to the uh, con Republican National Convention. So I said this to Rabbi Soloveitchik, um, I wish I remember what uh, we were talking about when we said it. And Rav Salvechik got all he didn't he clearly didn't know about this. In those days, he wasn't all there. Rav Salvechik. It was the end. Uh, he did not know about this, um, uh, or he knew and he forgot. Whatever it was, he didn't know. He got very excited and he wanted to hear about it. And then he said to me, uh, me and uh, Rabbi Jachter, he said that when he first he he said how important this is because when he first came to America. He was in Boston. He said, whenever an Orthodox, whenever a politician would come to town, the Orthodox who couldn't speak English, they would, when they had this delegation, I'll meet the politician, the reform rabbi would have to speak for the Jewish community. And uh, so Rabbi Soloveitchik thought how amazing this was that now you could have an Orthodox rabbi be chosen to uh, uh, give a talk like this. Uh, there were some. If I want to be honest, I have to say that there were some old-fashioned Orthodox rabbis who were involved, who had, I guess, mastered English, and who were involved not just with the general community, but with the non-Orthodox uh, rabbis and community as well. So one name that uh, I've heard mentioned, I haven't seen this in print, but uh, Rabbi Rekhefet has mentioned this, is Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Reif. As you could tell, he's an anical, he's a great-grandson of the Nitziv. Um, he was uh, the Rav of Camden, New Jersey. Now, Camden, New Jersey, you, for a while in the, I think it was the 1990s, Camden, New Jersey was the murder capital of America. It's since been overtaken by other places. But Camden, New Jersey had an Orthodox rabbi of uh, significance, an old-fashioned, and he was uh, on like a, a board together with uh, the non-Orthodox rabbis. I know that the rabbi of Scranton, a Sabotka Musmach, a rabbi there for like 40 some years, Rabbi Gutterman, Sri Gutterman. His shame call was Henry Gutterman, but Sri Gutterman. Uh, he would even come to Yeshiva Shabbat Ochanan to do the Bachinas, an old fashioned Talmud Chacham. He was involved with the uh, with the, the, the Federation of Rabbinic, they made like a rabbinic board or something, or um, uh, whatever, whether it's an official rabbinic board or he was involved with the non Orthodox rabbis in town for matters of Jewish concern. As Federation would have something, so he'd be involved with it as well. I asked Rabbi Fine from Scranton about this. Obviously, the rabbis today are, would never do anything like that. And he said, and maybe he's right, he said that Rabbi Guterman had to do that because in those days the Orthodox were weak. And if they wanted to have any, if they wanted to, to, you know, the Federation to look out for them, to do things, if they wanted to protect their interests, they had to be involved with the entire community, including the Orthodox, because the, otherwise the Orthodox would be overlooked. It could be right. I mean, I don't know. Maybe Rabbi Guterman had more of a policy role. You know, Mate Levy, we spoke about Mate Levy, more Harvard sense that he should be involved with everyone, uh, including the non-Orthodox rabbis, or maybe not. I don't know. But it was mostly the American-born um, graduates, not just of Ritz Hanan, but the other yeshivas as well, um, who were on the interdenominational boards, the rabbinic boards, the, 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 the interdenominational boards with the Federation, and their synagogues were members of the various local synagogue councils, and eventually you had something called the Synagogue Council of America, which had Orthodox, conservative, and reformed synagogues. I think, I don't know if it ever had reconstruction, it closes in 94, but uh, and uh, the Orthodox Union was a member of that. And this made perfect sense in that era. No one, thought, to my knowledge, no one thought it was problematic. Uh, no one of any stature, that is. Uh, and uh, I'm unaware before World War II of any attacks on this, even by the East European type of rabbis. It's, you almost get the sense that this wasn't their thing, but it's not their communities. I mean, they're, if you have a Stiebel in Brownsville, 
You know, there's no interdenominational because it just doesn't exist. But if you're, uh, you know, in Seattle or something, then it's a different situation. And uh, uh, the idea that these Orthodox rabbis were somehow legitimizing the non-Orthodox by being together on a rabbinic board or, you know, a federation creates a board of the rabbis and all the rabbis come together to speak about how best they can make sure matzah is brought to town or, you know, they're going to meet with the politician, all that. No one thought that this is giving the non-Orthodox rabbi legitimacy. What is legit? What's the legitimacy? The non-Orthodox rabbi, he has a show of 200 families. I'm the Orthodox rabbi. I have 150 families. We want to make an impact, so we're going to come together. It has nothing to do with me saying that his show is a uh, is a halachic show or this rabbi is a halachic rabbi. Uh, that's that's what people thought. And uh, when World War II came, arrived, there was a need to put out um, religious literature and give rulings for the soldiers. And the rabbis of all three denominations came together. They put out a siddur, they put out other literature, and uh, again, this was not thought to be giving legitimacy. It was thought that everyone understood there's Orthodox rabbis, and then there's non-Orthodox rabbis, and the Orthodox rabbis don't agree with the non-Orthodox rabbis, but uh, there's issues of larger concern that um, sometimes it's necessary to come together. Uh, this approach continues after World War II. And the 1950s, I think it's fair to say, are really the heyday of what we can call liberal modern orthodoxy. And uh, there's some really important modern orthodox rabbis who continue this model. Uh, Emanuel Rackman, Joseph Hochstein, even Leo Young, who uh, comes from German orthodox background. Uh, and uh, these, they were at the forefront of uh, involvement with, for the larger good of uh, Kal Yisrael. Now, everything changes in 1956. And if you believe the story that's told, I don't believe it. But if you believe it, here's the story. And I'll tell you why I don't believe it. The story goes as follows. According to the story, Mordechai Feuerstein, who was one of the leaders of the OU, I don't know, in 1956, he might have even been the um, the president. Uh, he's an important leader of the American Orthodox community and in, before Orthodoxy was fashionable. Um, very close to Rav Soloveitchik, although um, when Rav Soloveitchik first comes to America and Mo Feuerstein is a, a student at Yeshiva, at Yeshiva College, he actually uh, is in the opposition to Rav Soloveitchik. We spoke about this a few weeks ago. He's one of the opponents of the Rav in, um, in writing in uh, the commentator. Um, there were other opponents as well we spoke about. Uh, but he becomes very close, his father, and he becomes very close to Rasulovichik. And it's impossible for me to imagine that Mo Feuerstein would ever go around the Rav's back, as it were, or ask a question to another Godol. His rabbi was Rav Um, But at least as the story goes, he was with Rav Aaron Cutler at a wedding, and um, he asked him... Uh, um, you know, is it permissible for the, us, the OU, to be together in the synagogue council? Uh, these sorts of things. And supposedly, Ravaron told him no. Now, and this would shortly thereafter lead to the proclamation I'm going to show you. I don't believe the story happened that way, but it, the, 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 the Ravaron Cutler was definitely asked the question, and others as well, but he was the most significant of the rabbis, the old, old time European rabbis in America at the time. And this led to them, the publication of this document, which um, Agudas Rabbani, 1956, um, um, yeah, you see, Kitisa, uh, Yudches Adar, 1956. And uh, well, let me just read it for you. Um, it says as follows. We've been asked from uh, some rabbis um in the state and uh, in people musmachim from yeshivas, if um, in not the state in the country, when asked from there were different rabbis and musmachim if they could be a member of the New York Board of Rabbis and other boards. Remember, this was very common. Whatever big city you went to, if there was rabbis, they had them on uh, boards together um, because these boards are joined together with rabbis and also rabbis. Take a look how rabbis spelled. This is in the, the first time I ever saw rabbi spelled this way is in Igros Moshe. Or Moshe Feinstein, when he wants to talk about non-Orthodox rabbis, he can't call them Rav or Rabbanim. He'll call them rabbi or rabbis. And it's uh, that's how it's written. So with rabbis, reform and conservative. 
And he says, we've come together, we've had discussed this, and uh, it doesn't mean he came together in person necessarily, uh, all of them, but uh, came out from us, an Isser, uh, that it's Asr al Pidin Tars of Teno Kdosha, Liyoschavra, Lishtate, the Irgun Kaze, you can't, according to Halacha, you can't, Halacha, not just a wrong thing to do, but it's actually Halachic prohibition. Uh, to join in these organizations. We've also been asked, can you be a member of the Synagogue Council of America? So I, you might think, well, the rabbis can't because they're giving legitimacy to the rabbis. Well, can the Orthodox organization be together with the non-Orthodox organizations? And the answer is uh, as well that um, since non-Orthodox organizations are involved, it's us or to be part of them. We're not saying that you can't, it's us or to be part of an organization with non-Orthodox Jews. You can be a member of an organization designed to fight anti-Semitism, which has non-Orthodox Jews. They're not saying that that's a problem. What's a problem is how organizations that you're together at the Synagogue Council of America, where or heretical organizations come together. Uh, now, it could be, you can imagine, like a Satmar person saying, Satmar post you can't be a member of an organization, any organization, which has non-Orthodox uh, individual Jews. But that was never the argument here, it was not even Hirsch's approach. Uh, individual, we're not, the issue was about organizations. And who signed this uh, letter? Pretty much all, not all, but pretty much all the the uh, East European Godoli who come to America, not all after the war, but some before the war, after the war. The first is Avram Yafen, that's Navardic, Avram Kalmanovitz, Mir, Aaron Cutler, of course, in Lakewood, he's the leading figure here. Rav Gedalia Shore, from Torah Vadas, Rav David Lifshitz, Yishia Sarbitz Elchanan, Chaim Mordechai Katz, that's Tells, Yaakov Kamenetsky, also Torah Vadas, uh, Yitzhak, Yaakov Yitzhak Halevi Ruderman, Rav Ruderman of uh, Neri Yisrael, Yitzhak Kutner of um, uh, Chaim Berlin, Menachem Yosef Zaks, in English they sell an S, but it's pronounced the Zion. He also, Yishia Sarbitz Elchanan, the son in law of the Chafetz Chaim. He was what they call the Bochin. Anyone who went to uh, uh, YU um, in the 50s uh, or 60s will remember him. And of course, uh, Moshe Feinstein, the great Posek. Of these, um, although the case claim is often made that you know this is the, the example here, the beginning of uh, the movement of power from the communal rov to the Rosh Yeshiva. And it is true. All these people here are Rosh Yeshiva. Not one is a communal rov. And uh, that led to a great change. We see it today. When someone has a question, they ask the great Rosh Yeshiva. The Rosh Yeshiva, both the Haredi and in the modern Orthodox world, are the ones making all the decisions. Whereas before the war, it was post scheme, and post scheme were always in cities. And generally, Rosh Yeshiva didn't get involved in matters like this because uh, they they had to raise money from everyone, and they didn't want to offend people. But it was. But here you see the beginning, and also the move to Das Torah. A lot of people have pointed here. You have a declaration that this is us, sir, without. It's not a tshuva, it's not explanation. Halakhically, why it's us, sir? Like you can ask, why is it us, sir, to be in an organization with the non-Orthodox if we're not dealing with religious matters? We're just dealing with matters of Kali Yisrael, and we know this was done in Germany, and we know this was done in Lithuania and Poland. Although Rivaron might say that in Lithuania and Poland are just heretical organizations, but they're not actually reformists. But in any event, it certainly could be explained halakhically. It's not. It's simply declared like ex cathedra. Now, we're used to that today, where you go to Jerusalem, you see all sorts of signs telling you what you can do and what you can't do. But uh, this was like the first time, I think, in America, something like this had made any impact, uh, where they just declare it, and you either accept it or you don't, and you accept it by virtue of their charismatic uh, personalities, their halakhic standing uh, I do want to, though, clarify that among these figures, there are some who were communal rabbis. So, for instance, Ramosha Feinstein, or David Lifshitz, or Kalmanovitz, or Yaka Kamenetsky, or Kamenetsky was also a rabbi in uh, Toronto, and then in Seattle. So we we do have at least former communal rabbis, but at the time, none of them were communal uh, uh, rabbis. Uh, who's missing from it? Um, well, uh, before I go on, uh, I'll just say that uh, there is a, about this, the beginning of Das Torah, let's say. Um, now, what I'm going to say now is not, this isn't something at all intended by the signatories of this, but this is what it became. 
once this sort of document then became popular, and once declarations in a halachic sense were established in this way, it became fashionable in the Haredi world then to judge Rabbanim and Gedolim as to whether they were in line with the Das Torah or not. The reason why, now Ramosha Feinstein himself is not a fan of Das Torah. If you believe Rabbi Tendler, Rabbi Tendler said that the Ramosha said when they don't have a good argument, I think he said when they don't have a good halak argument, then they fall back on Das Torah. But uh, Das Torah has had a pernicious influence, if I could say that. Um, I know I'll be regarded as heretical in uh, some circles, but it's had a pernicious influence because Das Torah has led to the disqualification of Talmud Chachami because they don't tow the, the whatever da, the line of Das Torah is. We've reached the place now where you could be a great Talmud Chacham, but if you're not in line with whatever the Haredi Das Torah is, uh, in other words, Das Torah is not a halakhic dispute. Everyone in the Haredi world understands that if you have a halakhic dispute, let's say how, how, how hot it has to be for Bishel cooking on Shabbos, one rabbi says 120 degrees, another says 130, whatever it is, no one's going to disqualify the other side because they have a different position, even though, according to one rabbi, the other side, his position is Chol Shabbos. But uh, they understand everyone has different shitas. But with Das Torah and these ex-cathedra statements, once you make this ex this Das Torah statement, then the other Rav, who's not who doesn't accept it, doesn't matter what a big Atamachacham is. If a first Shachter, if he doesn't accept the Haredi Das Torah, then for segments, certain segments of the Haredi world, he's a Tamachacham, but he can't be a Godel. Because a Godel has to accept the Das Torah. So you go down the list, therefore, and you can disqualify, in the, especially in the extremists, but not just the extremists, mainstream Haredi world, the uh, Agudist uh, world, for many of them, you can't be a Godel unless you hold to the Das Torah. So that's what I say is pernicious, because it leads to the disqualification of many Godel Yisrael and uh, whoever came. This was not something that existed before World War II, for the most part. For the most part. Certainly not in the Lithuanian world. Hirsch also, I have to say, Hirsch, he, he disqualified the Mate Levi on that as well. But um, take a look at Vilna. Vilna, the, um, you know who's on Rav Chaim Moser's base in? The Marcheshes, Ravegas, Chanochenech Agus, and he was Mizrahi. So, th- did anyone ever think, uh, in, no one ever said in Vilna to Rechaim Moser, how could he be on the basin? How, he's not a Godel, because he's not, uh, he's a Zionist. That wasn't how the Lithuanians and the Polish Rabbanin thought. If you were in a town and you're in a Gudistan, and the Rav of the town is a Mizrahi, when you have a Shiloh, well, you ask the Rav. Fine, so then you have a different politics than the Rav. Or if you're a Mizrahi, you ask the Agudist. If he's the Rav of your city, you ask him. Contrast that with today, when many people in that world, uh, if you don't, if you're a Zionist, then you're puzzle. You, you never ask a Shiloh for you. Yeah, you're a Talmud Chacham, but they'll say your Hashkafas are krum. Your Hashkafas are fraudulent Hashkafas, and therefore you can't be a Gado, and we won't rely on you uh, in terms of Pesach or anything like that. So that, unfortunately, is the... Um, is the result of what became of this uh, idea of Das Torah and how it's been functioned. But who's missing from this list? Well, first of all, Solveitchik's name is obviously missing. Or if Eliezer Silver's name is missing. Eliezer Silver is a pulpit rabbi. He's the he's the, the like the the Zakain. He's the, the the elder. He's been in America for a long time. He's in Springfield, Massachusetts, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Cincinnati. Uh, he refused to sign it because he saw this as an anti. Yeshiva Shavitz Al-Khanan document. He said that since most of the students who this is directed against are students from Soloveitchik, why should these Rosh Yeshiva sign it? If they're following Soloveitchik, what's the point of such a, a declaration? Now, they, what happened was the Rosh Yeshiva wanted Rav Soloveitchik to sign it. He didn't. But from Rav Elazar Silver's point, once Rav Soloveitchik refused to sign, it shouldn't have been publicized. Now, Rav Lichtenstein writes that uh, Rav Ruven Grozovsky, also from firmly in the Haredi world, also refused to sign because he had the same attitude as Eliezer Silver that uh, these students uh, from Yeshiva Serbis Al-Khanan, and they were the majority, but not the only ones. You had students from other yeshivas as well who were members of uh, these organizations, but most were from Yeshiva Serbis Al-Khanan and let's say Skokie, or those days Chicago. The Rav Ruben Grozovsky also refused to sign because he says if they if they're following their Rebbe, why should we interfere? Now, two people 
When I mentioned this last time, two people, both learned, very learned in American Orthodox history, said it doesn't make sense because in 1956, Ruvurin Gazovsky was very ill, and it doesn't make sense that he would sign, he would uh, at all be involved in the uh, public square. I look, I don't know how ill he was. Was he in a coma? Was he? You couldn't talk to him. Uh, I mean, if he's in bed and he couldn't move, wasn't active. That doesn't mean he still can't sign the document. Rav Singh was living at that time. It's hard to imagine that he'd say something like that isn't false. Not to mention, in fact, he now is. It's Rav Singh then became part of the family of Rengazovsky with his son's uh, Yitzhak's marriage. So I, I don't know, but Rav Singh says Rav Rengazovsky had the same um, uh, perspective. Now Rav Moshe is said to have commented that usually we say that silence is acquiescence. Shtika koda danya. The Rav didn't sign, so he agrees. But the Rav Moshe said, not in this case. And that's true. And we spoke about in the classes on the Rav's letters that uh, the Rav refused to sign. He uh, he didn't, uh, from, and this has been confirmed by a number of people, although he didn't support these organizations like uh, the boards of rabbis. He never ossered it, and uh, he didn't think they were good ideas, but if people wanted to do it, uh, he didn't say it was forbidden. He thought that the Synagogue Council of America was important for the Orthodox to be part of. Walter Wurzberger writes that although the Rav, in theory, would have preferred that there never was such an organization, once it came into existence, he thought it was vital for the Orthodox to be a part of it, because you can't leave, as we saw when we discussed the Rav, you can't leave the public square to the non-Orthodox. If you're going to have an organization of Jews, of, commun of communal organizations, synagogues, the Orthodox have to be involved. The rabbis, you know, at the end of the day, how much do the boards of rabbis do? But the other organizations, it's very important that the, or the OU be part of it. And uh, the Rav's position follows the view of the Nitziv. Um, the Nitziv, and I'll tell you to the Berlin, right, he, there was this group in Galicia called the uh, Machziki Adas, and they were, I guess, enamored by what they saw in Hungary and what they saw in Germany, and they wanted to form an organization also in Poland that, uh, you know, separatism, to fight for separatism, so that the Orthodox can create their own community. So they're not in the same communities with the Bundists and the, the revisionists and the Zionists and all that. And um, that's when we see Steve wrote, he wasn't yet dealing with um, uh, revisionists, but, uh, you know, non-Orthodox types. Uh, um the Nitziv has a famous tshuva in which he says that we 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 cannot agree with this. He says that this idea of separatism is like daggers in our heart. He says that when we when we deal with the non-Jewish world, we need to deal with it together as a unit, then as one people. And then we come back and we fight among ourselves about all the various issues. But when we face the non-Orthodox, we have to face them together. And if you recall, I read this when I did uh, the classes on the Rav. The Rav said, in the crematoria, the ashes of the pious and those filled with praiseworthy deeds mingled with the ashes of the radicals and free thinkers. He says, we jointly fight the enemy who doesn't recognize the difference of the religious and the non-religious. And that's, so the Rav is following in the path of the Nitziv, and really what was the path in Lithuania? The uh, You could say, and many have said, that it's the other Russia yeshiva that broke with this. I'm not so sure they broke with it, because again, you could make a distinction. I'm not sure one, I'm not sure one way or the other. You could say that the Nitziv and others are speaking about irreligious Jews, but they're not speaking about reform and conservative. That is, they're speaking about irreligious Jews who simply don't want anything to do with religion. So we can be in one community with them because at the end of the day, there's no issues with the synagogue. They leave religion to us because they don't care about religion. But uh, when you deal with the um, the reform and conservative, then you're dealing with people who are twisting the Torah. They're not rejecting the Torah. They're 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 twisting it and make and creating falsehood. And that they're more dangerous. And that's a different circumstance, and they actually have synagogues. I'm not sure whether there's a difference. I can see both sides of this, because at the end of the day, what if you're dealing with a, some uh, Zionist, let's say, who's an atheist, I mean, isn't that also proud to be one community? Because you have to vote to decide who's going to be the rabbi. And uh, he's going to prefer, let's say, fine, every rabbi is going to be Orthodox, but he's going to prefer a, uh, a Zionist rabbi, and uh, he's going to prefer, why should he have a say at all? 
in choosing the rabbi. Well, you could say, well, he's a member of the community, just he's not religious. The rabbi has to minister to him too. But I could see how you could claim that uh, if certainly if you could be with these atheists and these com complete secularists, you can be with uh, people who observe some mitzvahs. Uh, but that's the argument. Uh, I'll just end with America. Um, I just want to read you a tshuva. You know, you know what? Uh, I'll do this next time. I want to read you a tshuva of Ramosha. Because Ramosha Feinstein has a short tshuva on this, where he does express his opinion. And I'm not sure how far to take this, if you want to follow uh, Rav Moshe. But I think Rav Moshe expresses the, um, the standard uh, view from that circle. Uh, I'll add one more thing. I heard this from Rabbi Luckstein. So Rabbi Luckstein, uh, Haskell Luckstein, who followed in his father's footsteps, he was very he was in the New York Board of Rabbis. He might have been the president, very involved with this. So he said as follows: I didn't hear it from him personally. He came to Scranton to speak. He was brought in by the Scranton community, not by me. Um, and uh, he was speaking about, uh, I guess, what's uh, uh, it's very interesting, Scranton, because a lot of the old timers. This is this is probably around two thousand, but a lot of the old timers the non-Orthodox Jews in Scranton complain about the Orthodox today because they always speak about how Rav Kutterman was very different. And in those days, the Orthodox rabbi was, you know, they, 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 they look back to the old days, the good old days, when they thought things were different. So they brought in Rabbi Luxton and he gave, you know, a rousing talk. Um, there, weren't, uh, there were very few of the Orthodox there. I can tell you that. It was all the general rest of the community. Unfortunately, all these people who were at the talk have since uh, passed on. Um, but um, so he spoke about his vision of Orthodoxy. And then he told the following story. He said that um, after Ramosha passed away, he went to be Menachem Avo, the children. And when he and um, um, when he was there, as he first, I think he's the way he described it as when he first came in, um, or it might have been before he even went to it, whatever it is. I think it was though when he arrived there, someone came up to him. You can ask Rabbi Luxstein, confirm it, and said to him, Right. You have a lot of chutzpah coming here to be Menachem Avo. You know that Ramosha spoke again and again against, you know, New York Board of Rabbis, and you refused to listen to Ramosha, and you joined it, and now you're going to come be Menachem Avo. So the person was saying that, you know, you spit in Ramosha's face, and now you're going to come. And Lukstein ignored him and went, and he was, and the, the children were received him very well and very happy. To, and Ramosha's point was, yes, I, I followed my Rebbe. But it didn't mean that I didn't have great respect for Rav Moshe, and I didn't see him as the great Osek. And uh, the, the the children, he said, could understand that I had a different position. It doesn't mean that they that there's something in the wrong with me going there. Um, so I thought that's interesting. Let me uh, get to the questions and the comments here uh, quickly. Oh, so next class, I'll just finish up with Rav Moshe, and then I want to turn to Rav Cook. I don't think I'll take the whole class of Rav Cook because. Rav Bomberger becomes important for uh, Rav Cook, And then hopefully we'll move into maybe next class, if not next class, definitely the class after. Back to Rav Bomberger. I want to fill you in on some interesting shitas he had and uh, some other things. Uh, ben says, how assimilated the Orthodox were or how integrated? Okay, I said show how assimilated they were. Assimilate, integrated, it depends how, who's talking. Obviously, if you're a Hungarian Jew or a Polish Jew from one of the Ostjud and they're called, and you come to Germany, you look at these uh, German Orthodox Jews named Adolf and, uh, you know, Yosef and all these names and go into the opera and everything, you see that as assimilation, not as integration. From the German Orthodox perspective, it's integration. Um, um, although, uh, you know, assimilation, we assume assimilation means um, assimilation then leading to losing your identity, intermarriage, all that. You know, maybe the word assimilation can also be used. You assimilate to the larger community. It doesn't, and it doesn't mean you lose all your identity. Uh, the German Orthodox Jews were German patriots. They were very attached to Germany. And Germany is a Christian country. It's not like America. I mean, it was a Christian country. Look at look at some of the literature around World War One. How attached they felt, and the, 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 what they were fighting for the Kaiser. So um, I guess we can debate: is integration or assimilation the best word? Um, Paul says rabbinic names. The late chief rabbi of South Africa, Rabbi Cyril Harris, Cyril K. Harris, K stood for Kitchener. This I did not know. I know Rabbi Harris's son, Rabbi Michael Harris. Those who don't know, he wrote uh, he wrote a very nice book about orthodox orthodox ideology in modern times. 
Well, I forget what it's called. It's like a Moran of Uchim of sorts. And then he, together with Professor Reinhold of Yeshiva University, published a very good book on Rav Soloveitchik and Nietzsche. And uh, so that's uh, Kitchener. I did not know that, Paul. Uh, very Anything English, I've learned that Paul is the expert on, uh, especially all this arcane English stuff. So shkoyach for that. Yeah, Nissan says, Rav directed you to pronounce the second sin at Yisafsar's birth. That, that, that's a, a minhag. There's a few minhagim. In fact, uh, as uh, Michael reminds me, if you look at the names of uh, Yisachar's Yisaf, children, one of his sons, one of the names that has a shin, and when it's repeated a second time, it's missing the shin. And so they, they, they say, well, that shows that one place you take it out, one you don't. There's different minhagim. And some say that, uh, in fact, if you look in the Hirsch's transliterated Chumash, not transliterated, in his German Chumash, the names up into in Bereshis, he call he writes it Yisachar, and later in other places it's Yisachar. So there's a whole tradition that you're supposed to read it the first time, or maybe not just the first time. Um, you said this, maybe it's the second sin. I mean, I mean the first time, the first time at his birth. That's what I mean. The yeah, first... only at his birth, right? Only at his birth. But I think there might be men hugging the others do it. Um, hold on. Uh, Rabbi Boich, actually, in Contemporary Alcha Problems, uh, Volume 1, he has an article, he just summarizes it. Uh, this is from when he used to actually have a column. And um, he says, uh, he says, the accepted practice is to vocalize the name Yisachar always. Um, however, uh, there is a practice um, um He quotes the Chassam Sofer, who says that, um, uh, yes, that the first instance of the word, you recite it, Yisachar. Um, so that, and there are many, it doesn't um, begin with the Chassam Sofer. This is a tradition. But you said the Minchashai. The Minchashai doesn't say that. Uh, well, yeah, I think you, you, put, you, you suggested Minchashai last week, or I, I thank you for correcting me. Oh, I thought, I, I thought you said, I said I wasn't sure. Uh, I said, I, it definitely wasn't, I said, the medievals. Ruth says, one last known name, Yisachar. In the Korah and Das Mikra Tanakh, there is no Nikud on or under the second shin. It would seem that the master rates did not pronounce the second shin at all. That's correct. There's no uh, Nikud on it at all. It's a silent letter. There's another silent letter in um, Asadi, in uh, Divrei Yomim, uh, um, on one of the words. But yes, that's it's unusual. The question is, why didn't they just drop it? You have a negation of sin. For whatever reason, it wasn't dropped. That's Ben Asher. That's what we uh, follow. However, Ben Naftali, it wouldn't have been. And uh, you would have had a Nikut on the, the second shin. Right, but the yeah. reason there's two there's two letters there is because of the way she named him, Yesh Sachar. That's, that's, that, that, that's really? what imply the Pshat, that it should, that's what Ben Naftali should be read as Yesh Sachar. Yeah, but you can't do that. So they just made it silent. Ah, so um, okay. So then it's uh, so that you're right. So that, but then why would there be the second sin? Because I was thinking that the whole thing was combined. It's not a sin or a shin. It's nothing. It has but no. Why is it? But presumably it was. The, I assume that it was two sins, or or a shin and a sin, and it dropped. You're saying it's not. Why would it be there though? No. It's, <laughs> There's no dot. There's no dot. I know, but why do you have the letter? That's the question. <laughs> the first, you know, the dagesh is because the shin drops. Why is there a second sin? To preserve the derivation of the name. Yesh Sachar is why she called him that. And so oh. the name is, you, so you spell it, and that's a remembrance. It's a zecher of why she called him. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Of course, it would be better if the then you'd have it on the second sin, that you'd have it, that the first shin was silent with no nakudot, and then the second, that would be better. But uh, okay, I like what you said, though. Uh, um, a, a, a Swarty taxi driver once uh, corrected my Yisachar to Yisachar. No, oh, Swarty, that's, uh, he's roughly wrong on that if he's Swarty. Uh, <laughs> if he told me he's a Hasidic guy, yeah. then they would say it. Hadassah says the great synagogue in Warsaw is not orthodox. Okay, when you say not orthodox, we have to say what you mean by non orthodox. It, it was, it had, men and women did not sit together. There's no organ. It's no different than any of our modern Orthodox synagogues today. There's a choir, 
stuff like that. You'd walk into it, you'd think the Coral Synagogue, you know, in Moscow or the synagogue in Vilna, you would think that they are Orthodox. Uh, they were they were regarded as liberal synagogues. And sometimes they could even hire a rabbi who would not have been regarded as Orthodox, but they functioned in an Orthodox fashion. Um, you had in Lemberg, Lvov, if you recall, the, uh, the remember the rabbi, the reform rabbi who was um, poisoned? <laughs> But his shul functioned. So what do you do when the shul functions orthodox, but the rabbi is not orthodox? I guess it's not orthodox. But I don't know in Warsaw if that would be regarded as non-orthodox. I, I don't know if any of the rabbis there, I think the rabbis were all considered orthodox, unlike the one in Lemberg. I think they were all considered liberal orthodox, uh, status quo or German orthodox types, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that in the great synagogue, all the rabbis were orthodox. Um, uh, Nissan says, Dr. Isaac Boyer, leader of Aguda in Germany, led Pole Aguda in Eretz Yisrael, even when Pole officially broke with Aguda over the issue of cooperation. Uh, uh, I don't remember all the details. I have the book, uh, The History of Pole Aguda Yisrael, but um, Pole, I mean, Aguda themselves would break. Uh, Pole and Aguda, in 1948, Pole and Aguda were together. There was all this tension. But in 1948, they worked together. They, they, were to get, they ran that. together, but Poale yeah. rejected Moetz's authority in political matters over the issue in cooperation with Yishev authorities. That was in 1940. I know this from high leaders in Israel. I was yes, told this. I think they came back together, and it wasn't until yes. later in the 19, early 1950s authority. when yes. they officially broke with them. Yeah. The, but the, the great, I, I learned it. It was, 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 it was uh, uh, not, you know, this was, uh, it, it broke my ears to hear this, but it, that's what okay, I was. Okay, but I think, I think in 1948, they still regarded the Emeritus Godoli Atar as bounding, binding them. In not in political matters, really. And that was the, uh, and then Rav Shach, of course, came and, you know, when he took, when he, he was the one who said, you can't vote for Dalit anymore. You have to vote yeah, for but I'm saying other, I, 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 with common Hana, they broke and the Chazonish came out. This is already in the early 50s. They officially, they went again. Okay, I didn't know. In, I know there's big machokas, and I have the book by Chaim Shalim on the history of Pole Aguda. Um, every election, also, every election, they, they will come together and they separate. Every election, they did attend the Yeah, speeches. they come together, but uh, the difference is that um, once they broke, they went against the Chazonish, then they were considered Mechut Samachana, and that then led to them really becoming more Tzioni, I guess you could say. Paul says Aguda in Palestine was founded by Moshe Blau, had no roots in Europe. Uh, and the nadir of their behavior was the lynching of an effigy of Kuk one Purim. The Aguda was publicly represented to the mandate by the Kovan figure of Dahan. Yes, we've spoken about all these matters before. Um, the Aguda, um, the Aguda Sistral ties themselves, though, to Ramosha Blau. And by the way, Ramosha Blau remains loyal to the Aguda, even though his brother is the extremist Ram Ram boy. If you recall the classes, Ramosha Blau dies in Chutzaretz, and Rasiuda Cook declares that that's his ownish for causing my father, bring my father's early death, that uh, the land spit him out. Uh, she even showed you the picture, the, a new picture that was uncovered a few years ago of them loading his body into the uh, the boat. But the, um, and we spoke in the past also about the um, the trial, the Tzirah Gudis Yisrael, how they put Rav Cook on trial, and then they actually, uh, they um, they executed him. That's the effigy you're speaking about. They executed Rav Cook, his effigy. They shot him. <laughs> they, they made believe they shot him. Well, I went through that whole issue that was in Bate Broid in, uh, in Jerusalem. This was Alan Meltzer, how he then refused to have any part of it. That's the sort of thing I'm, I'm speaking about. And yes, the Aguda was represented by Dahan, the first of the great anti-Zionists. If Dahan was around today, he'd be marching with Hamas and all the rest of it. Um, um, enough about Dahan. Um, let's see. Uh, I said, if I, Mo, Moses first, I said Morris first. If I said Morris, I meant Moses. Yeah, Mo. I said once, he sat uh, right next to me in uh, Young Israel, Brookline, because I moved to Brookline in uh, 1993, and I go to the young Israel, I don't know where to sit, and he's sitting like in the front row, and he doesn't know who I am, but he sees me, he says, hey, come sit here, because, you know, people don't like sitting in the front, so at the time I was at the young Israel book line, I sat in the front row next to him and his son, and uh, 
Nissan right. uh, says that Dvar Avraham was a Mizrachist. He was elected as a Dayan in Kovno. Dvar Avraham was not a Dayan. He was the Rav of Kovno. He was also the official Rav of Kovno. And he was not an official Mizrachist. He never was a member, but he was an, he believed in the ideology. And he was an opponent of Aguda. We even have a letter he wrote to um, uh, Rav Cook in which he talks about how ne very negative about the Aguda. And uh, look, the yeshiva world didn't care for the Dvar Avraham. And um, um, in fact, uh, Jeffrey Wolf told the story. I don't know who he heard it from. Um, the Dvar Avraham, he, he once supported this organization, this uh, in, in Kovno, the boys and girls coming together, some joint organization where young men and women come together. And the yeshiva students attacked him. And he said that, my, he said, I'm not the rub for the yeshiva students. I'm the rub for the entire community. And this is what we need to do. You know, he was very much a, a modern type of uh, forward thinking uh, individual uh, and a great, great posek. Uh, if you read the book of Rav Ashri's Chuvos, you learn a lot about him. And uh, unfortunately, he could have, he was able to leave. He could have gone out of, got, made his way to Switzerland, but uh, he, he didn't. And uh, he died, uh, but he, he, he died. He, he had a Kavura Sisro. He was not killed. He died in the, the Kovno ghetto. Um, Mem J. Franco says, Rav Henkin lived in the 70s and isn't there. Haven't heard why. Look, Rav Henkin was head of Ezra's Torah. He had to raise money from everyone. And he had to raise money from all the rabbis. He could never, he never, as a matter of principle, would sign any declaration, declaration like this. And not because he didn't have feelings. He says he has a responsibility. His job is to raise money for Torah. And he can't do anything that it's going to turn someone off and not give money. Look, if he would have signed it, could he go to Lukstein Shul then and try to raise money? So, um, but I don't know, look, he, unfortunately, his grandson's not alive. I don't know Rav Henkin's feeling. Rav Henkin might have personally agreed that there's nothing wrong with these organizations. But no matter what he felt, he couldn't sign it. And the yeshivas, pre-war in Europe, the yeshivas, Russia yeshiva would never sign, Rav, Rav uh, Hanan Wasserman is an exception, but the Russia yeshiva of Sobotka, Tells, Mir, they never would sign any declaration, any political declaration, because they needed to raise money from everyone. It makes sense. Um, Okay, uh, Paul says senior moment was Alan Alan being very really Jerusalem, but Kitchener. So I don't, I don't why would he call him Kitchener? Uh, um, okay, Bina says on the declaration of the state, the Aguda and PA signed independently. Is there a member of Pole Agudas Israel who signed the uh, Declaration of Independence? Yes, I don't. Yes, the government Kahana signed it. He not called it Kahana Kahana signed it? and I say it's there. The Rav Nu Benjamin, he was out. He was in. He was in America at the time. I, I, I know they're always separate organizations. My only issue is, I thought that in 1948 they still declared fealty to the Moetzes Gedolia Torah, and they would break that a few years later. Rav they Kahn, it, and he, I remember Torah. the child. Yeah. He spoke about it once at a Shalashudas in our Shtibul, the Poale Aguda, and he spoke about how it was. I remember this from my childhood. I was a young child, but I, I and I spoke to him later as an adult. It was something that was, um, it, you know, he, he it, it, it was with deliberation. He is in the classical picture, um, in that the long table facing Ben Gurion when he has uh, what was the name of the Mizrahi leader, the great. Uh, on his, on, on Ben Gurion's right side, I think. Maimon, Maimon, Fisher Maimon. Maimon. right. So no, there's a long table facing, right. you know, a perpendicular to them, I should say. And there's a very tall young man with a dark beard sitting immediately adjacent to that main table. That is Rav Kalman Kahana. That, that's not the issue. The issue I'm concerned with is. Paul Aguda Israel officially breaks with Aguda's Moetzes Gedolia Torah, and they appoint their own Rabbani, Mayor Karelis from the Chazanish's brother. But they, uh, they, I, as far as I know, in 1948, despite any issues they had earlier, they still said that they accept the Moetzes Gedolia Torah, although they represent the Poalim, the workers, etc. But at the end of the day, they will listen to whatever Moetzes Gedolia Torah says. I am certain that that was their position until early 50s when they would break with them and uh, join the government. That, that's my recollection. Agreed. And that, I mean, that's my certainty. Uh, 
Gershon says he wonders where the Yisachar dilemma is the origin of the phrase, kicking someone, you don't like it in the shin. Okay. <laughs> Listen, if it's funny because um, if you read the Rishonim, there's no Nekudos. So how do they tell you if it's a shin or a sin? So uh, it's not so simple. So sometimes, you know, they'll say things like as a... Like a, they'll use the word sin, the the right sin, you know, as, as a shin, so you know what they're talking about. I'll read you. Hold on. Um, let me read you, like just the last shown. I think it's even in the. Um, and this is the last thing we'll say. I think it's even in here. The uh, maybe they're from Shevet Ephraim. The hold on. So if you read, uh, hold on. Uh, just a second. Um, no, it's not uh, here, but they, um, they it's hard to know what they're speaking about sometimes, so they'll say, sometimes they'll use the word sin, I don't know if they're showing but the master rates will either say sin, or they'll say, um, you know, they'll say right, you mean, or small, uh, or what to do. What'd you say, Chaim? Maybe that's from Shevet Ephraim in the times of the Tanakh, that were not able to say sin. Yeah, I don't, but uh, I mean, look, I don't know. Uh, we know that the Rishonim could because they distinguish it. Uh, Lita then it goes back. We know that there are certain Lithuanian rabbis who couldn't say Shin. They couldn't say Shabbos, good Shabbos, it would be a good Shabbos. But uh, the, uh, as far as I know, we don't have any references to um, in the Rishonim or the Masoretes that uh, there's no distinction. They do distinguish it. They may, They say there's a distinction. So um, I don't know. Um, listen, we know that in Rishonim that uh, some of them didn't distinguish Patach and Kamat. So we see that. And we know that they did, other letters sounded the same. But as far as I know, Shin and Sin, uh, we don't have that. There's a Professor Steiner, right, uh, 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 from YU. Uh, he wrote a book, something like, what's the title of it? Richard Steiner, The Case for the Fricative Shin or something like that. Uh, some title that's really going to grab you in the bestseller list. But he's like the world's expert on the Shin and the Sin, Professor Steiner. Um, I think Rabbi Kelman, uh, as this says, okay, I think we are, uh, we're done. We're okay. finished. Thank you all for coming out. Final comments, Rabbi Kelman. No uh, comments, just, you know, listening no in to the, all the conversation. No, no. Okay, I mean, Tomorrow, Rabbi Shulman and Shir Shirm, I've been mentioning the last two classes. Wednesday, Rabbi Brody, Shlomo Brody, who's spoken a few times, will start a new series on military ethics that's based on, I assume, based on the book he just published uh, that just came out now. Oh, it's definitely and, going to be based on the book, and everyone, I'm sure, it's so in Yana Dioma. Yes, unfortunately. I mean, he wrote the book, obviously, before October 7th, but it just got published Within the last month, I, I believe. Um, so we'll be giving three parts here. It's going to have all our regular classes. Of course, today we had the the lost the your synagogue classes. I mentioned a lot of you were there this afternoon. And, of course, Shuli Mishkin, part two of her new series on the gates of Gaza. That's Wednesday. So they'll be Wednesday back-to-back. -back. Rabbi Nachbar is giving the Parsha to Shavuosh here this week. And I think that's pretty much it. And uh, appreciate your good news and good things. And everybody should be well. And like I've been saying, it's the winter, it's 2024, it's early. Everybody has uh, homework to invite one friend, one new friend to attend one class. And, uh, you know, then they'll invite a friend and they'll have a friend. And then cover the cover eatly, as we say. So everybody, uh, if you could do that, we'd be most appreciative. Um, word of mouth is the best form of uh, advertising. Okay, everybody. Line to Paul, if you wanted to say something I know from before, or um, you're fine. Okay, just... <laughs> Just checking, as Mark said, you're the expert on English, you know, jury, and I believe your master's is on the old Yishuv, is that correct? Your master's theories, um, thesis was on the old Yishuv of Yerushalayim. And, uh, okay, I know he's my my former boss, so uh, when he was in the years in, in Toronto at the uh, at Tenenbaum chat, if I can say that, I hope he doesn't mind, head of school for many years in chat, and uh, okay. Anyways, everybody be well. Lila Tov and uh, all the best, everybody. Thank you.